Let's look at cholesteatoma then, a very common uh, question in exams like this that often comes up. So it's worth having a look at a couple of pictures online of cholesteatomas. What is going on? Well, we don't really know why cholesteomas, uh, cholesteatomas occur, but essentially you're getting an accumulation of squamous epithelium and keratinocytes in the middle ear itself. Now, ultimately, this can lead to recurrent infection, but it can lead to erosion into nearby structures. And that's why it's really important to pick up um, and get seen by ENT fairly early if suspected. There are risk factors involved that might be in a question, things like being a male to start with, having a background of middle ear disease, a background of ear surgery, and things like eustachian tube dysfunction as well. But it may present in a non-specific way. So a lot of people get regular antibiotics for recurrent infections. So there may be a recurrent smelly discharge, there may be a background of hearing loss, and also other ENT or ear type symptoms like vertigo, like I mentioned, there may be a background of somebody having regular antibiotics to treat ear infections on the background of what is actually a cholesteatoma. So you can see the kind of buildup of all that material when you look at the back of the ear, but worth having a look at a few different images um, online to become familiarized. When you have that examination description in a question, there may be a, a talk of a conductive hearing loss. That might be the very first reason someone comes to see uh, or get checked out because of these symptoms. But when you look at the back of the ear with otoscopy, then you may see lots of discharge. The classic thing that stands out um, in terms of uh, cholesteatoma is your pearly white debris that you might see at the back here. Um, and also things like there may be a history of a perforated eardrum. So a background of perforation is also a high risk for cholesteatoma forming in the future. Certain investigations may be done by ENT, so audiology assessment, things like a CT scan to get a direct view. And if we suspect cholesteatoma, the guidance suggests that we should be doing a fairly urgent ENT referral to make sure we're not missing it. Treat any underlying infection that may be there on top as well. But one of the most common procedures that's done in ENT is a canal wall up mastoidectomy to try and really get in and get that whole area taken out. If untreated, then it can lead to things like recurrent ear infections. It can lead to that conductive hearing loss like we talked about. The, the production or the creation of fistulae, and ultimately, like we said, it buries down into nearby structures. So things like a facial nerve palsy, and ultimately things like meningitis as well. So very important to pick this up in a question um, if it's trying to describe cholesteatoma and refer to ENT. And if ENT, then various bits of uh, treatment, including surgery, may be needed. Another pityriasis to remember is pityriasis rosea. This is a common self-limiting skin rash, so it will get better itself. Classic, you get these pink salmon oval lesions, often preceded by a herald patch a few days before. So you get these, uh, quite hard to see here, but these kind of pink salmon lesions here, but there may be an initial patch that's a bit bigger that comes up before that gives you a clue that this is a pityriasis rosea picture. You can see why this might be confused with other skin conditions like guttate psoriasis, for example. If you get a question about pityriasis rosea in pregnancy, then you should be seeking urgent advice about how to manage it. Otherwise, in most people, it settles in two to three months itself. There's no specific treatment needed for pityriasis rosea, but you may need symptomatic treatment, for example, if someone's finding it quite itchy, um, and that might be something that you might need to treat, but otherwise, it will settle down itself. So how might heart failure present in a question then? So some classic signs and symptoms, orthopnea, so inability to lie flat, so therefore story having increasing number of pillows at night, PND, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, waking up short of breath, gasping for breath, probably the commonest presentation, shortness of breath on exertion, fatigue, nocturnal cough, and your classic pinky frothy sputum. If you get examination describing, you might hear the bibasal creps, the raising of the JVP, tachycardia, apex might be displaced because of cardiomegaly, third heart sound, your classic edema around the ankles and hepatomegaly when examining the abdomen. If you get a chest x-ray being described, look for things like cardiomegaly, curly B lines, upper low blood diversion and maybe small pleural effusions. In terms of acute management in secondary care, They'd want to be stopping any medications that might be causing a worsening of heart failure. Investigations will include things like blood count, use and ease, chest x-ray, ECG, echocardiogram. Maybe there's a need for IV diuretic if symptoms are quite severe. And there's no routine use at that point of things like opioids, nitrates, inotropes, or vasopressors. So that's your kind of secondary care, cardiology-based acute management. But what about if you suspect heart failure as a first presentation? So, so let's look at the combined oral contraceptive pill then, or COCP. This contains both estrogen 
and progestogen, and they act by inhibiting ovulation. Now, in terms of standard use, there can be different caveats for certain situations. Generally, it's taken, like we said, on a three weeks on, one week off basis. So there's a hormone-free phase that's normally a week's duration after three weeks of taking the pill every day. There are certain variations, like we mentioned, there can be a reduced hormone-free phase. So for example, instead of seven days, it's reduced to four days where someone doesn't take a pill. Things like tricycling can happen where someone takes, for example, three sets of the contraceptive part back to back. So three sets of three weeks together, and then they have a single hormone-free phase. So rather than three weeks on, one week off, it's kind of nine weeks on, then one week off. Or some people use it as a continuous use. So they don't have any hormone-free phase. They just keep on taking the tablet. So there's lots of different ways that it can be taken, but the standard use for a COCP is three weeks on and one week off. Now, first-line options when it comes to COCP are monophasic preparations. They contain 30 micrograms of estrogen and either noethisterone or levonorgestrel, but there are, of course, many types of COCP, so these vary. Let's look at some spinal emergencies that you don't want to miss in questions, and the first one is corda equina syndrome, a definite example of a spinal emergency. You're getting compression of the corda equina nerve roots below L2 level, and the commonest cause of this is disc herniation or disc prolapse at L4-5 or L5-S1. Now, presentation is going to include back pain, but also a lot of those red flags that we talked about earlier on in the chapter, so incontinence, perianal or saddle anesthesia, sensory loss, lower motor neuron weakness, uh, for example, loss of dorsiflexion or loss of ankle jerks, and then reduced anal toads. So these are the kind of things you don't want to be missing in a question. And if it is a true corda equina syndrome, then it generally will need surgical decompression correction, for example, laminectomy, to prevent further damage happening uh, further down the line. So definitely one not to miss in a question. So if you switch around and look at the opposite then, so hypocalcemia, so here a calcium level of less than 2.25, lots of causes, hypoparathyroidism, vitamin D deficiency, hyperventilation, pancreatitis, and also certain medications like bisphosphonates. Again, remember you, you treat hypercalcemia with bisphosphonates, so if, it, if you have too much bisphosphonates, it makes sense that you can go low. Presentation, again, can be slightly varied initially so and vague, so muscle pain, but can present with classic things like facial twitching and carpopetal spasm or convulsions. And you have those two classic examinations, don't you, for hypocalcemia. So you have Schwalstek sign where you tap on the facial nerve and you see kind of facial twitching happening and Trousseau sign where you inflate the BP cuff and it leads to carpopetal spasm. So classic. Um, we talked about these more in the, in the endocrine section, didn't we, when we covered hypoparathyroidism as one of the key causes of hypocalcemia. In terms of management, acutely, you have things like IV calcium gluconate or oral calcium preparations if it's not such um, a severe presentation. So um, hypercalcemia and hypocalcemia. So if you look at asthma diagnosis, then there's some core guidelines in NICKS as to how you should think about diagnosing asthma at the initial stage. So there are five things really that you'd bear in mind when you think about the potential or probability of an asthma diagnosis, and we'll go through these in detail. But number one, variable symptoms and history. Number two, personal or family history of A to B. Number three, a pheno result, fractional exhaled nitric oxide result. Number four, some kind of test which suggests airflow obstruction. And number five, direct bronchial challenge testing. So you essentially look at as many of these five things as you have available to you and you kind of look at an overall probability of whether someone may have asthma or not. So let's go through these five so you can pick them up and comes and comes in a question. So variable symptom and history, does it sound like an asthma story? Does it have that diurnal variation? Does it have those classic features associated with asthma like we just talked about in the previous slide? Number two, personal or family history of A to P, so things like allergic rhinitis, things like eczema, things like allergy like we mentioned. Again, having those puts you higher probability. Pheno, worth remembering, fractional exhaled nitric oxide result. And two numbers to remember, it's a positive score if it's 40 parts per billion or more in a steroid naive adult. If someone is aged five to 16 in a question, then a pheno result is positive. If it's 35 parts per billion or more, 
tests that suggest airflow obstruction. So don't get confused here between pheno and these tests. There's these three tests that are looking at airflow obstruction. Pheno is a different test altogether, so they don't come under the same bracket. But the three that NICE-CKS suggest can be used here are either spirometry, bronchodilator reversibility, or looking at peak flow variability. So if you look at spirometry first, someone has to be age over five for spirometry to be used, and you're looking for that classic drop in FEV1, FVC ratio, I less than 70%. If it's less than 70%, it'd be higher probability of something like asthma. Bronchodilator reversibility, basically when you give someone treatment, either a beta agonist or corticosteroid, does it improve the FEV1, does it improve the FEV1 reading? So you'd, you'd check the FEV1, you'd give treatment, then you'd repeat the FEV1. If it's improved, then you've demonstrated bronchodilator reversibility, which might be a, would push the probability of asthma higher. And thirdly, peak flow variability. So you ask someone to measure their peak flow at least twice a day over a two to four week period, and you look for a 20% variability in peak flows. If you get that variability, it increases the chances or probability of asthma being present. So three different tests for airflow obstruction. And then finally, like we mentioned, direct bronchial challenge testing with either histamine or methacholine. This needs a specialist referral, so a respiratory team would do this, but you may be presented with results um, in a question, for example, saying it was high, low, positive, negative, and that would all be factored in when you're thinking about the probability of asthma. Is it likely, is it intermediate, or is it unlikely? And then you can follow on your next steps. Let's focus a little bit on enuresis or bedwetting. Again, it comes up all the time um, in questions. So remember, enuresis or bedwetting is normal up to the age of five, and it can be common up to the age of 10. So it's not always in questions about enuresis that some action needs to happen, like investigations or management or drugs, for example. What are the type of enuresis that's being described? Is it primary enuresis with day symptoms? Remember, primary enuresis is when someone has never been dry before. So primary enuresis and they're having day symptoms as well, or is it primary enuresis without day symptoms? Or are they describing secondary enuresis, which is when someone has had, they've, they've had a period of dryness for around six months at least, and then they go back to bedwetting. That's secondary enuresis and may indicate maybe a physical cause and therefore may need uh, certain investigations, etc. So things to consider from a background point of view, what's the fluid index of the child like? What's the volumes of urine that they're passing like? What's the access to a toilet like? Is it you know the other side of the house and therefore they, you know, they can struggle to get there? Um, are there any school or home issues being described in a question that may indicate possible reasons for this? And then could there, of course, be a physical cause, so an overactive bladder? Could there be a diagnosis of diabetes that's not been made, UTI, chronic constipation, neurological disorders, child maltreatment? You'll hope that there are signs in a question that indicate some of these if they are present. And investigations can therefore be used to rule out some of these things like checking urine dips and sending off cultures, ruling out diabetes, etc., um, if you're thinking about um, a possible physical cause, certain risk factors that may lead to enuresis being more uh, prevalent, having a family history of enuresis, being male, having a background of constipation, background of developmental delay can all make you more likely to have enuresis. But because there are so many different causes, so many different stages of presentation and different types, there are lots of different things that might be appropriate as an answer to a question. So reassurance um, is often needed in lots and lots of cases of enuresis. There may be an access things like make sure you have a potty by the bed so people, uh, kids can just jump straight onto the potty rather than having to travel to another part of the house. Encourage regular urination, encourage pre-sleep urination. Practical measures, so waterproof mattresses, bed pads, for example. Positive reward systems like star charts and positive encouragement. There may be an enuresis alarm that triggers a little sound when, when someone has started a bed wetting so they can get up and go to the bathroom. Desmopressin, which we'll cover in more detail um, in a second, can be used short-term or long-term, usually a seven and above. It can be taken orally or sublingually. And there may be situations where you need to refer to pediatrics, an enuresis clinic, for example. For example, if someone's having daytime wetting, if they've had secondary enuresis develop, so after a period of being dry, back under recurrent UTIs, or if you're suspecting a possible physical underlying cause. So that's where you may think about referral for further investigation and further management. Scenario two in autosomal dominant conditions is where two parents have an affected gene. So both parents have the affected gene. That means both of these parents actually have the condition because it's autosomal dominant, but what are the chances in terms of children? 
So it now goes up to a 75% chance that the child will have the condition because they'll have at least one gene present. And remember, also in the dominant, you just need that one. Whereas there's a 25% chance that the child will not have the condition, this possibility here, because this is the only possibility that is possible that the person does not have at least one affected gene, i.e. it takes this gene and this gene from their two parents, 25% chance. Moving on to DPP4 inhibitors, so your gliptins, for example, then what does DPP4 stand for? Dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. Lots of examples, linagliptin, citagliptin, allogliptin, saxagliptin, vildagliptin, the two probably uh, common ones that you come across are citagliptin and linagliptin. A lot of contraindications for individual drugs, but try and remember some key ones, ketoacidosis, hepatic impairment, heart failure being a key one as well, and some cautions to look out for in questions, renal impairment, pancreatitis history, heart failure, again, as a caution, again, in certain drugs, as a caution, in certain, it might be contraindications, and those who are elderly, again, a long list of side effects, because there are so many drugs in this category, they all have different side effects, but generally things like GI side effects as well, again, constipation, diarrhea, gastritis, dyspepsia, reflux, vomiting, uh, come up in most diabetes medications, pancreatitis, liver issues like hepatitis and hepatic failure, neurological issues like headache, dizziness, tremor, for example, skin issues again, pruritus, angioedema, rash, urticaria, some musculoskeletal problems have been reported, so back pain, arthralgia, myalgia as well, and there may be an increased risk of infections as well when people are on certain gliptins. And what about monitoring then in case it comes up? So before you start a gliptin, someone should have liver and renal function checked as per the guidance and ongoing once you've started it, you'd be checking either renal, liver function or both depending on which drug that's been taken on a regular basis going forward. Let's look at gastric cancer then. So most people with gastric cancer will present with advanced disease. Underlying, there may be lots of risk factors in a question, male gender, increasing age, history of H. pylori infection, history of smoking, diet things like low fruit, low veg, and a history of things like pernicious anemia. So lots of things may trigger your mind to think about the risk of gastric cancer in a particular question. How does it present? It depends a little bit on how far down the process someone is, but it could be with your general dyspepsia type symptoms, um, indigestion, etc., weight loss, vomiting, dysphagia, anemia, abdominal pain, epigastric mass ultimately. It just depends on how far down the line someone may be when they present. Ultimately, they'll be having things like an endoscopy, biopsies may be needed, and a TNM staging is going to be used for your gastric cancer tumor node metastasis staging. In terms of management, if it is a proven gastric cancer, uh, gastric cancer sorry, surgery is, is the treatment of choice and could be a gastrectomy if it's a proximal tumor, could be a subtotal gastrectomy if it's a distal tumor, but also things like chemotherapy, like particularly 5-fluorouracil is sometimes used on, on top of this as well. Um, but it may be the stage where it's only palliative, uh, only, uh, only palliative treatment is possible um, and that might include things like CT scanning, uh, gastrojejunostomies, uh, depending on how far advanced that particular condition might be. So be aware of all types of options when it comes up to management for a potential gastric cancer question. So let's look at upper GI cancer and suspected upper GI cancer guidelines as per NICE. You've got to know this inside out for your exam. So there are four particular things that can be done within two weeks, i.e. on an urgent basis, if you suspect upper GI cancer in a question. Number one, an urgent upper GI endoscopy. Number two, let's look at acute glaucoma. This so the first thing to say about if you get a question about acute glaucoma, you have to admit them to ophthalmology. You can't be managing this in primary care, for example, or just in A&E, admit to ophthalmology. What is it? So normally you get ocular hypertension once the IOP, the intraocular pressure, is greater than 21 millimeters of mercury. That's ocular hypertension. Glaucoma is when you have ocular hypertension, so raised IOP, alongside other signs that indicate glaucoma. Things like damage to the optic nerve head, things like optic neuropathy, for example. So you've got ocular hypertension, and it's worth remembering that pressure level. And then glaucoma is when you have this plus other changes that give you indication of glaucoma itself. It can be split into different types of angle. So you have your open angle glaucoma and your closed angle glaucoma. So your open angle glaucoma is when the angle between the cornea and the iris remains normal. 
Whereas in closed angle glaucoma, the angle between the iris and the cornea is at least partially closed. So open or closed. Now, open angle glaucoma is mainly occurring with someone over 40 years of age. It's usually a chronic presentation and it's usually bilateral. Whereas a closed angle glaucoma can be both acute or it can be chronic as well. So you've got to look hard in terms of the information they're giving you in the question to try and determine which one it might be. Glaucoma presents in multiple different ways, depending on not least how long they've had glaucoma for. So if it's an acute glaucoma, then these should be spotted pretty quickly in a question. Severely painful red eye, nausea, blurred vision, oval pupil, that classic stony hard eyeball, um, thankfully quite rare, but it's something that should stand out on a question if you see acute glaucoma and of course admit to ophthalmology like we mentioned. 